Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi. Does being a sanctuary city help or hurt San Franciscans? The recent killing of Catherine Steinle, allegedly by an undocumented immigrant with a criminal history, has reignited the debate over whether protecting people from immigration authorities causes more harm than good. This debate has reached a national pitch, prompting Donald Trump and other presidential hopefuls to condemn San Francisco's policies. The House of Representatives has passed legislation that would restrict federal funds for cities such as San Francisco that refuse to comply with federal immigration laws. Today they're holding the funeral for Catherine Steinle, the young woman shot on a pier in San Francisco. Her accused killer had been deported five times, and that has ignited a debate over so-called sanctuary cities, where illegal immigrants are not turned over to federal authorities. John Blackstone is following this. The repeat felon accused of Catherine Steinle's murder, Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez, has become a notorious symbol of San Francisco's sanctuary policy. Steinle's death has brought proposals both in California's legislature and in Congress for laws that would force local governments to cooperate with federal immigration authorities. San Francisco's sanctuary ordinance largely prohibits city personnel from helping enforce immigration laws. Mayor Ed Lee. It was never contemplated that our sanctuary city would give protection to serious repeat felony offenders. San Francisco Sheriff Ross Mercurimi insists he had no choice but to free Sanchez without alerting Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Very literally, the spirit of that law uh, tells us that we should not be communicating with ICE unless they have a court order or a warrant. It just takes a simple phone call for that notification to happen. San Francisco is not alone as a sanctuary city. Some 200 other jurisdictions across the country have similar policies. In California, in the last 18 months, more than 10,000 undocumented immigrants were released without federal authorities being notified. A lot of political fallout from this. Uh, absolutely. Former U.S. Attorney Joe Russinello has been a longtime critic. It shouldn't be surprising to anybody who's been around this town to see that San Francisco sees itself as somehow an independent city-state. There are many calls here for a review of how a repeat felon could have been released, but Scott, in this city with a large immigrant population, most political leaders still defend the sanctuary law. With us on Justice Matters are Supervisor David Campos, former Supervisor Tony Hall, and USF law professor Bill Ong Hing. Now let me start with you, Bill. What is the sanctuary policy? What does that mean? And in San Francisco, we've had it since 1989. How did it come to be? Well, uh, Jeff, it, it came about in the height of the, uh, of the civil wars that were going on in Central America in the 1980s when thousands of victims of the crossfire fled to the United States from uh, places like El Salvador, Guatemala, and at that time, Nicaragua. Uh, and the United States government was denying asylum applications for most of those people coming here. They were being labeled economic migrants. They were being denied asylum at the rate of about 99% denial rate. Uh, and uh, cities and churches and other entities around the country decided to step up and send a message and say, you know, this isn't right and we want to help protect these individuals if possible. Now, a city can't pass immigration laws, but it can voice a view. It can take a strategy. And so the original intent of the sanctuary policy, as it was announced and reiterated at different points in the 1980s, was to declare that the city would not cooperate, would not go out of its way to cooperate with the Immigration and Naturalization Service and would not pick up the phone and call INS if a local law enforcement official encountered someone who had ran a red light who might be undocumented um, or was just encountered applying for public benefit. So that was the original intent. The, what you might call the most recent iteration came about when Super Avalos and other leaders of the city determined that ICE detainers, when ICE asked that local law enforcement hold 
an individual that ICE might be interested in, hold that individual for at least 48 hours, for 48 hours after the local law enforcement officials are completed with that person, hold that person, and then allow ICE to come in and get that person. And the truth is that there are many, many examples of individuals who ICE put detainers on that turns out that some were citizens. It turns out that some were victims of domestic violence. And it turns out that most of those that were, that were detained were individuals that were simply not any danger to the community. And so San Francisco, like other jurisdictions around the country, sent a message and said, we are not going to allow ICE to come, we're not going to hold these individuals for 48 hours for ICE. Um, if you want them, you've got to come after them in a different way by issuing uh, warrants that are signed by judges. And, uh, and unless it's somebody who's a very, very serious criminal who has been convicted of a serious crime, we're not going to hold that person because we don't believe that this is a good policy, that ICE detainer policies are a good policy for policing in our community. And Tony, mm -hmm. what do you think? I mean, did you think that this policy went too far? Uh, the sanctuary city status, I mean, has been that way for many, many years. And I think most San Franciscans agree that's a good thing. You may disagree. Uh, but what do you think about the idea of, you know, not handing people over to ICE or not cooperating uh, with the immigration authorities. Do you think that there's a problem with that, that that should be stopped? Well, let, let me just say this. Bill's uh, history rundown of how it came about is exactly right. Uh, I was around when that happened. The original sanctuary city, city policy for the city and county of San Francisco was a refugee ordinance to protect innocent aliens that were here and faced with a reluctant government to give them any kind of status regarding immigration. There was no intent in that policy, nor should there have been, to protect illegal aliens or undocumented aliens who have committed crimes here and have repeatedly committed crimes here. And I can go into a bunch of examples and statistics, but that's, I think, too early for that at this point. That was not intended in the original ordinance. As it has morphed or, or, or uh, evolved over the years, because of political pressure, politicians pandering to certain voter blocks, whatnot, uh, it has led to a situation where the mechanisms of sanctuary cities, and they differ from city to city, have actually offered protection to felons and people who have committed crime here. Now, what has that done to a cohesive yet broken immigration system? That's what we should really be talking about, and I think we will get to that. Any discussion will lead us. How do we fix that? Has sanctuary city uh, policies done harm? Absolutely, in my opinion, yes. Ha is there a need to protect those aliens, those uh, innocent law-abiding aliens that come here by whatever means from being deported by ICE agents who indiscriminately uh, go after their immigration status? Yes, I agree with that. Not when it comes to those who have committed crimes or involved in the commission of a serious felony at all. I, I don't think they should be given the protection of a sanctuary city. Now, David, the, the Due Process uh, for All ordinance, you were on the board uh, when uh, that ordinance was debated and ultimately passed. and It was signed into law uh, by the mayor. Uh, what is the import of that law, and how does it affect uh, the way that our city deals with ICE detainers? And, and for the viewers who may not understand what a detainer is, it means that the government actually can uh, not only detain you, but can move and transport you uh, to an immigration holding uh, facility. And it's, it's something that um, the due process uh, for all ordinance uh, was implemented in order to prevent. So tell us what that, what that is and, and, sure. and why it was passed. Let me say that uh, I, I think that what gets lost in the hyperbole is uh, the policy reasons beyond uh, protection of refugees that sanctuary became a policy in San Francisco. There's actually a public safety uh, reason behind it. Uh, as a police commissioner, I can tell you that I, I had conversations while, while I was on the police commission with many chiefs of police 
who talked about how it was important for people who live in our communities who happen to be undocumented to actually trust law enforcement, that it actually makes an entire community safer when an undocumented person who has been the victim of a crime, has been the witness to a crime, feels free to come forward and report that crime to police. And there are actually many examples where by coming forward, undocumented people have actually prevented crimes from happening, have actually helped to solve violent crimes from happening. So I think the reason why the Board of Supervisors unanimously and the mayor uh, passed this ordinance was really to not only address the issue of refugees, but actually to enhance public safety. The problem with this incident, and let me say this, that what happened is a tragedy, and it's a horrible tragedy. And I should mention my office represents uh, the individual who is who's charged uh, well, in that incident. Well, the, the thing about this tragic incident is that a lot of different things went wrong and led to this happening. The problem that I have is that the, the immediate thing that has happened is that people automatically point to sanctuary as a reason without actually taking into account that there were many mistakes that were made. And I think that instead of generalizing and saying sanctuary is at fault, I think that we should look at the facts. And in this case, I think that one of the problems is that this individual, by the way, was deported a number of times, and yet he was coming into this country. I also believe that this individual should never had, have been in San Francisco to begin with. And actually, one of the things that a number of us have proposed is to make sure that we look at the system that actually has San Francisco enforcing warrants that are 10, 20 years old that, that should not be enforced. Right. It's it, that, it was a drug war from 20 years ago now, and, that caused him to be brought back right. to, to San Francisco. And, and the fact that that warrant is in, is, is, was enforced uh, doesn't mean that there is something wrong with sanctuary. It actually does point to another problem in the system, and yet no one's talking about that issue. No one's also talking about the fact that here you have a gun that was available. Uh, by the way, a gun that, that belonged to a law enforcement agent. And so my point is that many things led to this incident. Sanctuary is one piece of this puzzle. But the, the law that we pass is a law that was never intended to protect criminals. In fact, the law has uh, a provision that says that if there is a violent crime, crime implicated, that individual is supposed to be turned over. But I think what's happening is that the, there is so much political hyperbole and people like Donald Trump uh, are using this, this issue. And I think that my friend Tony Hall has some legitimate concerns. But I think the concerns ultimately don't point to sanctuary, but actually a larger set of issues. And that's what I hope we can get to. I, I know you're chopping to respond, but yeah. let, let me just ask you <laughs> one, one thing, and I'll go yeah. back yeah. to you, Tony. So, you know, the, the, the two different perspectives, uh, you know, should we have a law that also protects individuals who may have been convicted of, of crime? That debate, is it an important debate to, hap to have? And how do, how do you see it as, as someone who has studied immigration policy and also the failed policies of the federal government? I think everyone agrees that we have to reform our immigration laws, but that hasn't happened. Well, I'll, I'll, take, the, uh, I'll take the position just to be different here, that uh, I actually liked the very first version of the due process for all uh, proposal that Supervisor Avalos proposed, and it had no exceptions, that even someone who had been convicted of a serious crime would not be turned over. And I'm for that position. This is why. The, first of all, uh, and it has something to do with what Supervisor Campos just said about the trust of the entire community, that there are many people that have been convicted of even violent crimes in the past that are immigrants who have served their time. We're not talking, incidentally, we're not talking about anyone who has not served their time. It's people that serve their time in jail and have been released. And many people have come back into the community, they've straightened out their lives, but yet they might still be deportable, but ICE has not acted on those. The, that's why they're, even in the current version of the due process ordinance, if there's evidence that the person's rehabilitated, then the sheriff has the discretion to allow that person to not be turned over to ICE. And I like that in that as well. I just simply think that when you're talking about deporting 
criminals. There are different types of criminals. And the State Trust Act has, a, has an exception in it that's similar to the due process ordinance that ha has an exception for anyone convicted of any felony that, that an ICE detainer should be recognized. But the San Francisco ordinance is a little bit more generous. And I just think that San Francisco did the right thing in terms of letting that person go. I know that's going to be controversial with your viewers because that person did not have, the alleged shooter in this case, did not have any record of a violent past. In fact, for 18 years, he was mostly in ICE custody. For 16 of the last 18 years, he was actually in ICE custody. He kept coming in and out, and they kept on catching him and putting him in federal detention. His convictions in the past had to do with nonviolent drug offenses. And so I must say that I really think that the reason why this tragic incident occurred was a failure of rehabilitation efforts for individuals who may have mental health problems, failure of gun control issues, failure of other abilities for individuals like that to be afforded opportunities to be rehabilitated. So I wouldn't have an exception for violent felons because those people ICE can go after on their own. They can go to the state system, get them right out, out of state custody or federal custody. They don't have to mess around with San Francisco. Tony? Bill, you know as well as I do that uh, ICE is, is a broken system. Our immigration laws are broken. It's underfunded. It's politically motivated. Uh, they have their hands full just t chasing those violent, serious violent offenders who have been released. Now, I'm all for compassion, but I think it's about time that we start looking at the compassion of law-abiding American citizens who become victims. Let me just read out a couple examples, if I can take a minute, and uh, to put this in a different perspective. And David brought up part of it. Last year, from January 1st through August 14th, through, through August 31st, 8,145 individuals with serious, violent crime histories were released by sanctuary cities into society. It's across the United States, 276 different uh, sanctuary city jurisdictions. Of the 845, 63% over 5, over 5,100 had serious prior criminal histories and they were labeled as public safety concerns. Hear me out on this. 25% of the 845, or the 8,145, uh, were already felons at the time of release. This makes no sense. So when you think this thing through on a 25% on a of those that were released of the 845 went on to commit an additional 4,300 crimes of a serious nature, serious violent nature. The interesting thing is that since that time, we now have 17,000 people who have been released. 60% are still at large because the immigration system is broken. And I go back to my original contention, that's what we should be focusing on. Not setting up cities and municipalities with sanctuary policies that divide our national laws on immigration. This is what Sanctuary City is doing. It's putting the, the wherewithal of law-abiding citizens at risk because we're le releasing so many of these individuals into society. Those figures, by the way, are according to the Center for Immigration Studies. I'm not making them up. But hear me out on this if, if, they, if we can. If we don't address the shortcomings of ICE and we don't start looking at it for what it really is, maybe the solution is to set up federal magistrates or judges who are afforded this information who could then can make a decision about the immigration status. Because there's no doubt about it. ICE agents indiscriminately have uh, tried to de issue detainers. And we should explain what detainers are for the public out there. They include information about the history, the, the, the criminal history. So it's a very complicated thing. I'm not disagreeing with anybody. I'm trying to make some sense out of this thing and moving forward. Am I for sanctuary cities the way they presently are? No. Was there a need for them back in the 80s? Absolutely. My, I, I have complete compassion for those who came here as refugees and were suffering persecution. They should be protected until a path of citizenship is established. But to be indiscriminately deported, no, I'm not for that. David, response? Well, I don't think you can throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
what's happening here is you have a pretty tragic incident, and I think that those of us who have looked at the facts have provided some solutions for preventing something like this from happening. But the reality is that we cannot resolve uh, a tragedy by creating an even worse uh, situation. Because what's going to happen is that if you make uh, law enforcement agencies like the San Francisco Police Department or the Sheriff's Office an arm of immigration, that I think will have the opposite effect. That will actually make our communities less safe. I think that what we require is a measured response that actually addresses the specifics of what went wrong here instead of saying, you know, sanctuary is bad. Uh, and generalizing that. I think that what we need is a very strategic and targeted response, which is what we're trying to provide. But I think that if you ask uh, people like Chief Breton, uh, former chief of LA of New York police, they will tell you that on balance, sanctuary actually has helped communities. It actually has helped to keep these neighborhoods safer because it has allowed people to report crimes that they have been witnesses to or that they have been victims of. Now, clearly something has to be done, and I agree with Tony. That, that we need to make sure that the intent of not helping criminal activity is, is, is addressed. But I think that throwing the entire system actually will make things worse. The other thing that I would say is this, that part of the problem here is that we also don't have a totality of the picture because for every individual that goes and does something wrong that Tony points to, I can tell you that there are hundreds hundreds of people who are undocumented, who have interactions with police, uh, who report crimes, who, but for the fact that they have, you know, this immigration status, are law-abiding citizens. And what's happening because of, what, of this horrible incident is that an entire community is being blamed for the actions of one individual. Yeah. What this individual did is wrong. And the, the undocumented people themselves will tell you that it is wrong, but they don't want to be blamed for the actions of he one person. He hasn't been person. convicted of anything yet. <laughs> I, I, That's why I haven't talked about this case. Not yeah. only have I been gone the last couple of months, but I don't think it's fair <laughs> yeah. to talk about this yeah. case. There's, there's one other issue that I do want to get mm -hmm. to, is that there is a, a new program now, right, that's known as the PEP program from the Obama administration. Right. Can you just briefly describe what that program is, and is it going to... Uh, address the policy concerns raised here. Right. What led to the nationwide uh, litigation and resistance to the to the ICE detainer program was something that the Obama administration had mastered, called the Secure Community Secure Communities Program, which um, basically allowed ICE to take the fingerprints of any fingerprint that was sent to the FBI. ICE would take it, and from that they would determine whether or not somebody they thought was deportable, and they would issue the detainer. Uproar occurred. So that was thrown out in November, just this past November 2014. And in its place is this new program, Priority Enforcement Program, the PEPCOM program. And it purports to focus exclusively on dangerous criminals or people that present public safety challenges in, in other ways. Um, it, it also purports to not use detainers in the first instance, to simply use request, informal request. In in detainer. Uh, is a informal order that allows a person to be held. It, it is an ICE. order. It, it is an order. A detainer is an ICE. Well, it's an ICE request. It's not an but order. It also includes information about the background and why. That's and right. That's important. That's right. Whereas so that's the, been de-emphasized under the new program. Right. Under the first part of the new program, In it's just a request. Of notifications, Notif which have absolutely no legal binding. Right. You know it as well as I do. That's so right. this new program that Obama has has initiated replaces a secure communities program that at least issued a detainer that had some teeth. Now again let's look at take it away from the agents and let's put it in the hands of a, a magistrate or judge. It becomes a whole different thing. It becomes a whole different process. So I, I didn't I, mean to be no, cut jumping in on that. No I'm agreeing with you yeah. actually I was going to say that I agree with you on the second part of what you're saying. Uh -huh. That when it comes to ICE detainers, my preference and the advocate's preference would be let put that in front of a magistrate judge Absolutely. and let them issue a warrant. Absolutely. Because then, then you've got to follow, and we know that an objective decision maker <coughs> has looked at it. But let's not throw the baby out with the wash or, or, or miss the right. forest through the trees because we're ignoring detainers. That's what I'm saying. 
because the information detainer and detainers is correct. The process well, is flawed. Well, well we, they, we think it's correct, but we will know it's correct if a magistrate judge. I agree. I agree. Well, well, I, I think that. we're in right. agreement on that. But yeah. what I'll tell you, right. one of the problems here is that you have local jurisdictions like San Francisco that are trying to do the best they can. But the problem is that you do have a broken immigration system. And what you have from the Obama administration is, you know, they're, they're proposing band-aids that, quite frankly, are not going to do the job. Right. Uh, and I think that instead of, you know, walk, you know, talking around the issue, we should talk about what is needed. And what is needed is comprehensive immigration reform. And until that happens, you're going to continue, unfortunately, to have these horrible situations. And then you're going to have a federal government that, quite frankly, is not doing its job. Uh, and let's be honest about Obama. I mean, Obama, uh, you know, for all the talk about immigration reform, he hasn't prioritized immigration reform. He has, you know, deported more people than George Bush did. Uh, and, and is the situation better? No. Uh, and so we in San Francisco are trying to do the best we can, but we're not going to be, uh, I don't think it's right for us to become a political piñata when the reality is that this is a problem that has been created at the national level and it's going to have to be solved at the national level. I, I totally agree. On that note of agreement, we're out of time. San Francisco has long been a lightning rod for conservative critics across the country. But the truth is that San Francisco's immigration policies aren't wacky or far out there. There are 31 sanctuary cities in the United States, including our capital, Washington, D.C. That's a fact that's easy to forget amidst election year posturing in politics. I want to thank our guests, Supervisor David Campos, former Supervisor Tony Hall, and Professor Bill Onhing for being part of our show. See you next time on Justice Matters.